Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. With us is a former cabinet member and domestic advisor to President Lyndon Johnson, Joseph A. Califano, Jr. Joe has written a dynamite book with the rousing title, Our Damaged Democracy, We the People Must Act. Sharply focusing upon a subject of vital importance to us all, Joe sees a deeply seated partisan divide along political, economic, and racial fault lines, combined with a sharp decline in public confidence in our venerated institutions. He argues that the real threat to 21st century America comes not from ISIS, terror, Russian hacking, or China trade infractions, but from ourselves, that we are so much at odds. I'm pleased to welcome Joe Califano back to the program. Well, I'm so great to be, it's so great to be back here. Now, you've been a Washington insider for many years. You've been a member of the executive branch. Uh, why do you write a book uh, where you're so critical of the state of our government? This is a fundamental systems change in our government. It's been building over half a century now. The president is too powerful. I'll give some examples of that, but just a snapshot. The Congress is crippled, as I say in the book. I mean, they're just not functioning. The courts, as you well know, uh, Jim, from your own book, are, are, have become partisan. Uh, and, and money and gerrymandering and a whole host of things are just polluting the system at a time when everybody's split. The divides in the media and the politics in government are severe and deep. Well, you write in the book, it's really quite a brilliant observation, you say, uh, and I quote, this is not, as liberal Democrats might see it, a Donald Trump or Richard Nixon problem, nor is it, as Tea Party members and Republican leaders might see it, a hangover from the hundreds of great society domestic programs adopted in the 1960s. This is about the persistent aggrandizement of power by one president after another, regardless of party. It runs far deeper than Trump's course bullying, Nixon's criminality, Clinton's perjury, FDR's New Deal, LBJ's vast domestic agenda, and Obama's venting, his frustration with the gridlock legislative process by issuing executive orders to implement his policies. This uh, is, uh, is quite a statement. Uh, how did all this evolve? Well, let me tell you how, what happened. Uh, the, the presidential staff st started to build. The original uh, National Security Council was very small, uh, created in the National Defense Act. Uh, when was that? Oh, that was 1957, but uh, uh, Kennedy and Johnson had a staff of about 50, never uh, uh, 50 all, all through the White House, an NSC staff of about 20 or 15. Every president kept adding to that staff. Uh, the big jumps came with Clinton and with uh, the Bushes. And then by the time Obama left office, there were uh, 450 people on the National Security Council staff. Well, think about that. There was, in the foreign area, uh, somebody for every assistant secretary of state, uh, policies being made in the White House. If you, if you had a choice between being secretary of state or the head of the, of the National Security Advisor, I think smart people would take national security advice. And more you wouldn't power. have to be confirmed by the Senate. So. You wouldn't have to be confirmed by the Senate. And that's just one staff. Uh, the, the legal counsel, the, you know, uh, Kennedy had two people, uh, Ted Sorensen and M Mike Fellman, and Johnson had a couple of people, Harry McPherson and Lee White. Uh, and then that started to build. Well, they didn't have the legal problems that, uh, that Donald Trump has. Or the Clinton had. Or the Clinton had, yes. Or Nixon. I mean, Nixon, right. Nixon started to build it, then Trump. But what's happened is, as that staff has grown, its power, the power has grown, 50, 60, 70 special counsels to the president. And uh, if you take uh, two, two wonderful examples, when George Bush uh, was trying to get the Justice Department to okay the uh, torturing of prisoners uh, by the CIA, uh, the pressure, just as resisted, terrific pressure, and pressure from the White House counsel, they okayed it. When Obama went into Libya and uh, went to the, to the Justice Department and said, 
do I have to report uh, hostilities to the Congress or get out in 60 days, which the law said? And they said, yes, you do. These are hostilities. Obama went to his own counsel who said, no, you don't. He took his own counsel's advice. So that happened. And on the domestic policy side, I had the first domestic policy staff, four people. Four That's, people. That staff is now 250 <laughs> today. And then communications, Jim. The communications operation at the White House is, is so vast that it's like having a government, a media, a government, state-run media that we usually think about in a country like Russia or China. Think about this. You have whitehouse.gov, you have YouTube 24 hours a day, uh, you, 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 you have, have Twitter. You have Twitter, <laughs> you have internet, you have the inter, you, interactive internet 24 hours a day. You have over 400 people in communications now because they're watching everything. Uh, they're putting stuff out on every social media event and they're, and they're pumping out because uh, whether it's Obama making sure that CNN and MSNBC get everything or Trump making sure that Fox News gets everything, they're, they're covering this media. That's a phenomenal thing. I mean, one, one of uh, Bill Platt, the, uh, one of the CBS reporters said, it's a state, you know, government-run media. Uh, so that kind of power, plus one that uh, you'll be very familiar with, which is the president, you know, the, the, the Constitution says the federal law can eliminate state law. Anything, supreme it, law of the land. Supreme law of the land. But now the supreme law of the land is also the regulations and the executive orders that presidents issue or that they direct their departments to issue. So we have a phenomenal cluster of power. And what do we, we're supposed to have three branches, separate and equal. The Congress is not equal. The Congress has really, uh, it, it is consumed with raising money. Uh, if you're, I, I have in the book, a, a section of every single Democratic member of Congress in the 9th, 2013 year had was assigned an amount of money to raise. And, and, and there was a whole chart. Have they raised it? How much cash on hand are they doing for the, for the Democratic campaign? So as soon as they're elected, they have to start raising money for the next race. That's right. And, 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 and they, have, they call it call time. Right. The Democrats are supposed to do four hours of call time a day when they're in Washington. That means they walk across the street to the Democratic Club. Republicans do the they same they can't thing. do it on government property. They have to do you, it across you, the street. You've got it right. And so, they're, you know, they're, they're, to, to run for office, to run for office, a senator in the 2016 race had to raise about $30,000 a week, a week for every week of his six-year term and incumbent to have well, the money. Well, you argue our legislative system has been corrupted by campaign finance it, and particularly enabled uh, by the uh, Citizens United decision. Absolutely. Yeah, Cit well, tell about that. Well, Citizens United, the, the Supreme Court said money has First Amendment rights, and then they gradually... Money has First Amendment rights. How does money get First well, Amendment Well, because rights? the court gives it to them. Because five it. justices said so and four said no. That's right. And, but what those five did is they said it made it possible for somebody like uh, the Koch brothers on the right or, the, or Steyer or uh, Soros on the George left. Soros on the left. To, to say to, to a member of Congress, I want this. You stay with me on this climate position. You stay with me on uh, relaxing uh, restrictions on marijuana use or else... And, and I'll give you all the money you need. I mean, there's no limit on how much somebody can give, either, either directly. The book lays out how, what a farce it's become now. You can, you can get a presidential candidate. You're supposed to be allowed $2,700 per person. Yeah. But you can give $10,000 to each of the states, that's half a million dollars, and they can give it to the presidential candidate. There's now a lawsuit beginning to, yeah. to attack Plus that. Plus the PACs, because uh, the political action committees, because uh, before a candidate announces he's a possible candidate, he can control his political action committee, raise money, uh, and it's not independent. 
and then suddenly announces that it's uh, supposedly independent and it's already taken positions on a lot of issues that favor the candidate. You're, you're absolutely right. And think about this. Uh, when a candidate is going to run for office, it used to be the first question he or she would is, what can I do for my district? What can I do for my country? What can I do for my city or town? Now the first question is, can I raise the money to run? Can I raise the money to run? And that really, incidentally, one of the real, it's not just the corruption of, of money on public policy. It's, I think, the money problem, the corruption also affects the quality of the candidates we can get. Hmm. Because, you know, it's, it can be awfully demeaning to raise money. LBJ, Lyndon Johnson used to say, you know, I'm, I, I hate this, where presidents have to go hat in hand to people that want something from them. So, so, so when somebody says, well, you know, you're going to have to spend uh, more than half your time raising money, and they say, well, what do I need this job for? Yeah, what do I need this job for? And, and so, so we have that, that effect here. We also have the courts. It's not, as you, you point out, 5-4. You know, We're not getting, you know, we, we can't even get to 6-3. Uh, and they're partisan decisions with uh, the Republican-appointed justices voting one way and the Democrat-appointed justices voting the other way. And, and consistently. Consistently for, on, on these core issues. Many, many years. And then we also have this, this, we have a federal court system where a district judge can issue a nationwide injunction. So you go to the right judge. I mean, if, if you want to, uh, you want to have... Obama's immigration plan declared unconstitutional, you go to the Eastern District of Texas, <laughs> go to the judge, the judge declares it unconstitutional, it's dead. If you want to knock out Trump's plan, you go to San Francisco, get a Democratic judge who would contribute it, he knocks it out and it's dead. So when the people, I want people to understand this, this, is, this is really affecting our freedom and our, and our ability to govern. Well, uh, you know, Justice Scalia was famous for saying uh, that uh, the Bill of Rights is not really what protects your freedom. Uh, any banana republic can have a Bill of Rights. What protects our freedom is the, are the checks and balances and uh, the division of power among the three branches of government. And now you argue that that's all breaking down. Yes, and, and, and think about, you know, if you're, if you're somebody that says, oh my God, Trump, scares the hell out of me. I, I don't know what he's going to do today or tomorrow or this or that. But I, 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 I read this book. This is a nonpartisan book, but if you're worried about Trump, you, you better look at the massive amount of power that's now concentrated in the, in the White House. Let me give you, Obama couldn't get anything done in Congress, so he, he, he governed with executive orders. But, you know, you can, the next president can change an executive order. When I was in the White House, uh, fair housing, the unions and the civil rights people all wanted fair housing. And they wanted Johnson to do an executive order. And they would call me, George Meany and some of the others, even Martin Luther King. And I go to the president, I say, you know, just if you issue an executive order, they all want it. And the president said, we've got to have a law. If I issue an executive order, this is going to be very unpopular. The next president can repeal it. We get a law passed by Congress. Took a while. We were, we were out there three or four years, but in the wake of King's assassination, Johnson got a law passed. If that had been fair housing, it would have been repealed. Look at uh, Trump is just wiping away with his executive orders, uh, Obama's executive orders. Another thing people have to realize is, since Congress can't seem to legislate, I mean, they can't really pass bills of <laughs> any significance, and when they do, there's so much compromise and so much fuzziness that the president and the executive branch get terrific power to define things. Well, they did overwhelmingly pass a bill imposing <clears throat> sanctions on the Russians for tampering with our election, <laughs> and uh, Trump has failed to implement the bill. Right, <laughs> and, he has, and incidentally, he's got plenty of precedent <laughs> from Obama and the Bushes and Clinton of presidents saying, no, that involves foreign policy, that's mine, I don't yeah. have to do that, I don't have to impose those sanctions, I don't have to do that. And <clears throat> where there are law, you know, we can't, who should be on welfare? And who should be eligible for food stamps? Well, the, the, the law is written in, with enough breath so that the, in, the in, incumbent president and his staff can say, well, this is how we'll define poverty. 
this is how we'll define need, this is how we'll define disability, and so they're really making these decisions. The president becomes his own Supreme Court. <laughs> He becomes his own Supreme Court. He becomes his own Congress. Yeah. How, what is Congress? They pass one bill a year, <laughs> the appropriations bill, and it's begrudgingly, it, begrudgingly, <laughs> and it's and it's all in one package, and it takes months for people to figure out <laughs> in that two or three thousand pages what's in there. Uh, no, no, no real appropriations hearings. And pretty soon you have a trillion dollar <laughs> deficit. So <laughs> every year, <laughs> yeah, after year after year. So, uh, Joe, this is really uh, is quite dispiriting, but doesn't this really reflect uh, the partisan divide we are in as a people? I uh, think... I mean, we've changed in a way. I mean, it used to be uh, uh, they would... Uh, Gallup would take a poll, would you want your uh, uh, daughter to marry outside your religion? And, I don't know, 60% would say no, 40%. Now it's... Uh, that's completely subsidiary. They say, would you uh, want your daughter to marry someone of a different political persuasion? And they all say no. Overwhelmingly, they say no. So we want to associate with people who share our political values. That's right. I, I put that in the book. Yeah. It's stunning. It's stunning. That poll, those <laughs> c contrasts of those polls. And, and, and we, have, we, have, you know, we have a terrific racial divide between the parties that I think we should think about hard as a country. We have a regional divide. We have a regional, and, and just think of it, the Democrats cannot win a national election without 90% of the African-American vote uh, and a big turnout uh, at the conventions. You look at the conventions the last time, 50% of the Democratic convention was white, 25% uh, was African-American, and uh, the, most of the rest were Hispanics and others. The Republican convention, 90% uh, was white, or almost 90%. Less than 1% was African American. About 5% was Latino. Now that's, that's not healthy for the country. So we have that divide. Then we, also it's the single issue divide, that uh, no matter how much somebody agrees with a candidate, if they disagree about abortion or they disagree about uh, right to die, uh, they'll vote against them. That's right, or, 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 or a gun issue. Or a gun issue, yeah. Uh, Guns, uh, gays, and God. It's a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a great way to put it. But that's true, and that's, tr that's tragic. So we don't look at the character of the candidate, you know, does, is he pro-life or is he pro-choice? Is she for my view of climate control or is she not for my view? Is she for gun control or not for gun control? I mean, that's absolutely correct. It's laid out in the book, it's a tragedy. We have, and just, I want people to understand how these problems are interlocked. Add, add into the Supreme Court citizens case and the fact that if you've got billions, you can do that. You can say, I will only give you money if you go with me on this issue the way I want. So these, these guys become ventriloquists, you know, financial ventriloquists uh, with senators or congressmen mouthing what, they, what they're told to say. Now, uh, President Trump has an approval rating and presidents were always uh, very uh, jealous about their approval ratings and looked at them almost every day uh, historically. There's an approval rating of it hovers around 40%. It's up a little bit. It's down a little bit. Uh, is he able to govern uh, have a minority approval rating and having such a low approval rating? He is able to govern. And the reason he's able to govern is because there's so much power in the White House. The Congress is so weak. Even though they, you know, they criticize, they are not strong. They are not an equal. They're not a co-equal branch, and and I think, you know, he he. There's a lesson in what he did, for for people, voting. You know, people say, well, you lay out all these problems. What can you? People have to vote, and we have to have people voting, knowing what they're voting for, and voting for knowing that it's important to vote for people of character. That's where the other disparities comes in. We have an education gap in this country that is mind-blowing. I mean, 
lousy public schools all over the country in rural areas and in cities where kids are not getting an education. The part of education says 40% of our kids that uh, graduate from high school in, in their senior year are not uh, up to speed in basic math or basic reading. So we, that is, is really exacerbating things. Well, we have about 12% of the population is functionally illiterate. Uh, there's a lack of uh, understanding of basic civics. Uh, you have 35% of Americans think uh, George Washington crossed the Rhine River. 30% uh, <laughs> of college graduates uh, tell uh, uh, Pew pollsters uh, that they never read a book after college. Uh, many, many Americans can't name uh, uh, three of the branches of government, or the three branches of government, or even one of the branches of government, and 10% think Judge Judy's on the Supreme Court. Right. So what do you do with an electorate <laughs> like that? Well, I mean, I, I, we, have to, we, we have to educate them. We, we so it's are, going to take a lot of time. Well, it will, look, there's nothing easy that's happened in our country. It took 50 years for all of this to accumulate. It's going to take years to get it done. But if I had to pick you know, job in terms of investment, investment should be in better schools, these, these strikes that are going on of teachers saying, you know, you keep cutting us to pay someone else, and you keep cutting what you're giving the kids in schools. We have to educate those kids. There's a family issue there, too. What are the families doing? You know, when you and I went to school, I bet you're the same as me. My parents said, you got to study. You don't get out to play until you do your homework. We need, we need, we need some of that simple stuff back. But people must vote. I mean, Hillary Clinton, Jim, got the, Republic, the Democratic nomination with 7 or 8 percent of the eligible voters. Trump got the Republican nomination with 7 or 8 percent of the eligible Republican voters. I mean, that, and people have to vote in primaries. They have to get involved, you know. If, if you're out there now and you, th you should find out whether your congressman is going to have a primary, and you should get involved in that. And, and which side Maybe run against them. <laughs> Maybe run against them. And, and, this, and the gerrymandering. Yes, what about the gerrymandering? I mean, Trump said it was a rigged system. Is it a rigged system? It, that is rigged. If you just think about it, you have the district, so the Republican will have an enormous advantage, or the Democrat will have an enormous advantage. The party primary then becomes the real election. And what's happened in our country is, on the Republican side, it keeps pushing candidates to the right. And on the Democratic candidate, it keeps pushing candidates to the left. And in the course of which, they make these commitments that I will not compromise. Mm. I will stay. So they come to Washington having committed never to give. You know, we've turned compromise into a four-letter word, with this system. and. Uh, can't, give it, can't give in to evil on it, the other it, side. It, it's not a single party issue. The Republicans are the, are the gerrymandering champions right now. Uh, but for decades, the Democrats were the gerrymandering candidates. And it's every state. You now, know, now, what about the media? Our media is partisan. Our think tanks are partisan. We have Fox on the right. We have MSNBC on the left and, and now CNN on the left. Uh, uh, and And... You know, used to be that I have a, I'm a reporter, I have a professional responsibility to report the facts, you know. But now what it is, is we have customers. We want ratings, we want customers, we want our customers to watch, so we're selling a product. And that's how Fox News looks at it, that's how MSNBC looks at it, that's how CNN it's looks at it. It's all about selling soap suds. So, yeah. unfortunately, we've come to the end because it's been really fascinating, Joe, but I have a question for you. And my question is, will we ever fix our damaged democracy? We will fix our damaged democracy. How long is it going to uh, take? It's going to take years, but we can start. We can start with these congressional elections if everybody listening and everybody that is, can vote registers and gets out there and gets involved early in the primary. That's important. We can fix this if uh, the Supreme Court, I think the case can now be made that, that uh, Citizens United has 
diluted the value of the vote significantly and the Equal Protection Clause should come into play to give Congress power to limit the money issued. I think the court has before it, as you know, uh, two very important uh, gerrymandering cases, uh, one with Democrats in Maryland and one with Republicans in Wisconsin. Get into the gerrymandering thing. Earl Warren, the great Chief Justice, said the most important decision of his years was one person, one vote. Baker v. Carr. Well, we've run out of time, but I want to thank you for coming by. Well, it's all about money and it's all about thank gerrymandering. You. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.